Bueno, siguiendo un poco en, digamos, en el viaje escalar que hemos trabajado desde que hemos empezado a iniciar desde ayer, eh, esta segunda jornada baja de esta escala interestelar a una dimensión y a una escala más social. ¿no? Me gustaría empezar a introducir la jornada de hoy con una cita que he recogido de los libros de cuadernos de los 60, entre una conversación entre Mecas y Pasolini, que como sabéis, Jonas Mecas estuvo la semana pasada por Madrid y entonces pues, el interés y el trabajo volvió a circular y me encontré esta cita que me ha parecido bastante pertinente para la jornada de hoy. ¿no? Mecas eh, le con decía... Esto, o sea, esto es una cita directa a Pasolini, que le quitaremos al, el cine a la industria y se lo daremos a los hogares. Ese es el verdadero sentido de lo que llamamos cine underground, ¿no? en esta suerte como de profecía. Pero a Pasolini le responde que todos los hogares tienen una máquina de escribir y eso no significa que escriban más y mejor. ¿no? Las cámaras son como un bolígrafo en nuestro bolsillo, es una herramienta más para comunicarnos, pero no necesariamente mejor. Quería introducir esta idea como de herramienta porque precisamente si ayer veíamos imágenes de planetas, de galaxias y cómo digamos la producción visual está dando forma a esos mundos, en esta jornada lo que vamos a intentar explorar a través de estas tres charlas y también del debate y la provocación es qué mundos y qué realidades está produciendo la infraestructura tecnología contemporánea. Es decir, qué cambios de paradigma y qué tipos de realidades están moldeando la computación a la escala global Internet, los dispositivos móviles, las redes de información y las nubes de datos, las aplicaciones y ciudades inteligentes o la automatización de varias esferas de la vida ¿no? y la inteligencia artificial. Es decir, y de manera más concreta, ¿qué tipo de circulaciones afectivas, qué nuevas teorías están alentando tanto el software como el hardware o qué tipo de cambios en el, en el contrato social y en nuestra capacidad de, no, de narrar, de contar historias y de construir mundos en, en definitiva? Para ello vamos a explorar eh, tres casos. El primero, Mohamed Salemi, que lo tengo a mi derecha, que ahora la va a presentar Margarida Méndez, que va a hablarnos de cómo la inteligencia eh, artificial está llegando, según varios eh, teóricos y varios ingenieros, a una suerte como de de de, 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 ¿no? de callejón sin salida, en el que puede producirse una desaceleración que también vaya a afectar el entusiasmo y las diferentes teorías que hay en torno a la automatización en, hoy en día. En segundo lugar, tendremos a César Rendueles, que va a, a trabajar, un, va, perdón, a compartir digamos, una charla que de alguna manera trata una, un vector que ha estado presente y va a estar presente también mañana en todas, estas, en todas las charlas, pero sobre todo en la propia concepción de las jornadas. ¿no? Y es un poco cómo la nueva producción visual está afectando formas de producción emocional y circulaciones afectivas. Es decir, cómo la imagen y la producción audiovisual genera formas de desafectación y cómo eso evidentemente transforma el paradigma y el contrato social. Y en tercer lugar, vamos a tener a Meta Haven eh, por, en videoconferencia. Por los que no estaban ayer y porque veo algunos de los afectados del taller aquí entre las filas, eh, mil perdones o de nuevo por... Bueno, por, el, por, la, por la anulación de, de un taller que, que mucha gente había hecho diferentes cambios en sus agendas para poder participar. Ellos van a presentar el proyecto de Digital Tarkovsky en el que se interesan cómo hoy en día la captación y la producción de imágenes está llegando digamos, a unos niveles sin precedentes que evidentemente está cambiando toda nuestra forma de imaginar y de narrar. Por eso la idea de volver a Tarkovsky, volver a otras formas de atención y volver a otros ritmos de narrar. Por último, la provocación esta tarde, yo estoy especialmente ilusionada de que lo vaya a hacer Marta Peirano, que es periodista y que va a hacer esa forma de recoger un poco todo lo que se ha dicho durante el día y iniciar, incitar y lanzar el debate, que espero que, que todos os quedéis y participéis de ello. Bueno, pues sin más, os dejo con Mohamed Salemi y con Margarida. Um. Hello everyone, welcome back. I, I have to speak in English because my Spanish, I'm still rehearsing these days. Uh, welcome to the new faces. It's good that the debate is enlarging. The workshops have been really reinvigorating. So today here with us for the first panel, uh, we have Mohamed Salami, uh, who's a friend and we've worked together in the Guangzhou Biennial 
last year in a commission. And Mohammed has been running the New Center for Research and Practice, a teaching uh, platform online that has been active since three years and has been on the front line of philosophical discussions uh, that are quite urgent today. And I uh, invite you to take a look at it. There's an extremely good archive of past lectures that you can follow. It's very enriching. Mohammed is also an artist and a critic, and he writes in uh, many platforms and has been shown at Vita Vit, Ascala One, and other places. And thank you so much, Mohammed, for joining us and also for the workshop contributions. Yes, Mark. No, 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 no any. Okay. okay, it's that's good, good to have you here. That's good, that's good. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, how much time do we have? 40 minutes? Hey Siri, could you please set up an alarm for 40 minutes? Okay, I set an alarm for 4.58 p.m. Uh, hello and welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, I will be presenting a... Once I get into it, it's sort of a lecture performance, but just to like contextualize it a little bit, this piece was developed over the course of the last uh, last, I would say, eight months. And I began thinking and writing and preparing for it uh, right in the guts of the US election prior to Trump's victory. But it somehow sort of like the development of it coincided with, with, with Brexit and with, with, that, uh, with that catastrophe. And uh, so it somehow tries to deal with the question of technology, but also the question of politics. And I just came back from seeing both the Venice Biennale and the Documenta, and I kind of like s basically the, the 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 worries that I or the concerns I raise in the in the piece were sort of like already for me was sort of like present in in these two major international exhibitions, whereas actually the question of technology has been completely ignored or dropped already. It's no longer fashion. So I kind of like vindicated for starting this this paper like back in last September and October. So in a way, I've, it's, it's sort of like, it, it's still an urgent question because actually some of this impact, impacts of what I'm talking about is already happening in, at least in the art world, right? And so it, it, it is a performative piece and don't expect, don't expect it to make full sense. It's, it's art in a way. But, but, but I mean most of what I'm saying is just like we just, and I, hopefully we get into a good conversation about it afterwards. So, yeah, so let's just have to. Viewed from inside contemporary time and space, the internet paradigm, network discourses, and computationalism appear as a series of sensible theories and philosophies that model intelligence and the operation of cognitive, social, and natural systems based on the mechanisms of computer hardware and software. But viewed from outside of this particular contemporaneity, computationalism is a specific worldview, one which is perhaps already reaching or will soon reach its peak. Experts from the fields of artificial intelligence and philosophy of technology agree that a sudden decline in research and development as well as enthusiasm about high technology is inevitable, given the fundamental limitations of both our knowledge of the workings of the brain, as well as the limitations of our concepts and, mat and materials supporting our existing technological infrastructure. There is a widespread belief among those who follow these decelerating developments that technological progress will experience a major setback within the next decade with new advancements greatly slowing down, if not halting altogether. The most pressing issue, however, is the political reality of our technologies, the study of which has historically come to place most, if not all of our intelligent machines in the arsenal of the rich and the powerful. What will happen when, in the near future, technological progress is politically subsumed, evolutionary decelerated, and culturally forgotten. Before making any arguments around this question, it is important to draw distinctions between artificial intelligence, or AI, 
and machi machine intelligence, or MI, and to explain why it is important to abandon the former for the metaphoric imports afforded by the latter. The term AI has two major flaws, one ontological and the other historical. First, calling the growing intelligence of our machines artificial is misleading. It valorizes and therefore prioritizes humans, mammals, and other life forms over the automated intelligence of our machines. These machines, of course, are not only scientific entities stemming from applied mathematics and physics, like our computers are, but they are also political and cultural technologies that grow out of the social and collective nature of humanity. The term AI ignores the machinic features of life and designates for machines an alien ontology and history outside of nature. Even if we disagree with the statement that nature is machinic and contend that machines have only emerged as a result of human activity, the designation of AI glosses over the fact that machine intelligence is never autonomous and has always featured at least some degree of human participation, both individually and collectively. Second, the historical problem with the term AI is that placing the emergence of machine intelligence in the future rather than in the past neglects how, neglects how much of our previous or current systems, which have been designed and constructed through intense interactions between human intelligence and the world, have already been machinic. Calling machine intelligence artificial conflates our already existing cultural and technological realities with science fiction's autonomous machines. Depending on where we set the bar, in the same way that the exceptional condition of Earth in the universe grants it artificiality, the uniqueness of life compared to dead matter carries with it an air of artificiality. Language, art, literature, and cinema, which are by far the most complex technologies developed by humans, are perhaps the best example of artificial intelligence which existed prior to the cybernetic revolution. The, the analogous features of the, of the natural, technolo natural the technological, and the technological spheres should prompt us to abandon the concept of artificiality and return to a humbler, yet more rigorous concept of machines if we are to understand what is at stake in relation to the emergence of complex form of machine intelligence. Aside from the semantic limitations of the term AI, there are other impediments to the further developments of machine intelligence, which are simultaneously conceptual, physical, and most certainly political. And they find reflection in the three categories of nature, political economy, and technology. Many from the traditional left believe in the finality of the political limits of technological progress. They assert that we, we are moving toward the permanent political hold of the capitalist class over the means of technological production. As Bernard Stiegler puts it, capitalism is no longer an economic system as perceived by Marx, but a novel episteme setting the contemporary limits of knowledge a new universalized form of political epistemology or ways in which we know what we know even beyond politics. For Stiegler, capitalism is becoming not only a specific system for observing and navigating the world, but in fact, the only remaining one. For him, the clock is ticking on the time left for humans to overturn this development and set knowledge free from the limits that are increasingly imposed on it by the political economy. Soon, there will be little to imagine or do outside capitalism, since the system is inscribing itself into the world as the fourth nature. These epochal transformations, which sometimes coincide with major political shifts like Trump's presidency, make ethics, politics, or aesthetics outside capitalism impossible. But is the relationship between political economy and technology rigid and unidirectional? Can political economy completely subsume all the emancipatory potentials of technology? 
Responding to this question requires us to delve into the philosophy of history, especially if our inquiry is to avoid the three traps of romantic naturalism, Marxist economism, and technological vitalism. Even though technology shares its material and historical substrates with the two categories of nature and political economy, it is possible to rethink techne as having a materialist history of its own. The historical trajectory of today's technologies reaches back to the emergence of language and reaches forward towards the future of machine intelligence. Like a triple helix, the interrelated histories of nature, political economy, and technology impact each other, but maintain their autonomy in the last instance. The stability of the universe, or nature at large, which contains the small and isolated island called planet Earth, cannot be taken for granted. At least one can argue that science in general demonstrate that nature has never stopped evolving. Meanwhile, the evolution of political economy out of natural history does not bind politics to the limitations of nature. Nor can it be claimed that political economy can determine a particular destiny for the future of either nature or technology. The limits we set and the horizons we open for our understanding of the natural world, as well as our social and technological advancements, require the constant reassessment of the changing complexities with which these three entities simultaneously relate or oppose one another. Meanwhile, any major shift in one category can significantly impact the other two without fully subsuming them. The promises and dangers involved in further developments of machine intelligence can only be understood in the context of the trilectics that technology constellates with nature and political economy. As discussed earlier, the limitations to machine intelligence are partly physical, partly conceptual, and partly political. These limits, not unlike the trilectics described above, engage each other while maintaining their autonomy over how they each mitigate the further developments of technology. The physical limits of machine intelligence have to do with the scarcity of resources and the limited ability of our current materials used in the construction of our intelligent machines. These materials reek of the Industrial Revolution and the 19th century, as we have rarely come up with ingredients flexible, organic, if not also durable and self-repairing enough to carry the rising physical burden of the immaterial labor performed through automation. Technological procedures run on physical materials from rare earth mi minerals and lithium all the way to the energy required to operate machines. The scarcity of these material necessities is even changing the priorities of large technology companies that have been engaged in machine intelligent research causing them to also focus on more immediate tasks. For example, Google is entering the energy sector due to the company's own high demand for energy, and Amazon, because of its own demand for data capacity, has become a major web server company. In addition to its material limits, artificial intelligence research is reaching its scientific and conceptual limitations, which have to do with our different understanding of what constitutes thinking and cognition as well as how these concepts can be programmed for and realistically expected from non-living entities. The conceptual limitations of co computation have their roots not only in mathematics and physics, but also in philosophy. To begin, temporality, or the conception of time, has long been at the heart of the question of thinking. To understand the relevance of temporality to computation, one must grasp the parallels between our limited knowledge of time and the way this limitation is reproduced in our machines. Early 20th century phenomenology, with its heavy focus on the question of time and temporality, influenced how cyberneticians like Norbert Wiener understood the mechanisms of feedback loops, which were necessary for forging the relationship between an observer and a system. 
For Wiener, the emergence of cybernetics takes place at the same time that we move away from a Newtonian conception of time towards the Bergsonian temporality or towards Bergson's idea of time. Bergson's phenomenology validates the idea that human intuition can only be substantiated on the basis of how the inner consciousness of time understands and complexifies the linear and consecutive outer time of the world. As has thus far been conceived as a simulation of the human brain and not alien life forms. So, I'm um, sorry, I, I, I misread. What I meant to say is that artificial intelligence has thus far been conceived as a simulation of the human brain and not alien life forms. This itself is a sign that we don't fare well in thinking speculatively, speculatively about machine intelligence since we have, li we, have limit we have limited its conception to that which exists exclusively in relation to tangible forms of intelligence that is familiar to us. All life forms on Earth are subject to a universal time, the outer time, which is in tune with the speed of evolution in relation to the temporal positioning of Earth in the solar system. Our cyclical natural time, composed of days and nights and seasons, has always informed so much of the rhythm of planetary life and its slowly awakening consciousness of itself in the form of life and then later on in the form of like, uh, animal cognition and then later on with humans, more, co more complex form of cognition. Not only life, but also our human conditions of living, being, and understanding have historically been prisoners of this particular temporality that we somehow inherit from sort of like this, the time of our solar system. Even though our understanding of time has changed, we are still limited by what it means to understand time. According to Edmund Husserl, the internal organization of external time by the human mind is made possible by the twin processes of backward-looking retention and forward-looking pretension. Reaching deep in the past and out into the future is how the passage of present time or what he calls primal impression, becomes anchored in our consciousness. One takes the present and makes it a memory, then access that memory, thus bringing it to the present. Then there is the other process through which we think about the future and make it part of the present and retain it for later use. According to the neuroscientist and cybernetician Francis Varela, our experience of the world is not of a series of unconnected moments. Indeed, it would be impossible to have an experience of the world if we did not have a sense of temporality. That our perception brings an impression to our mind depends on retention and pretension. Even based on this limited understanding of consciousness, which is itself predicated on the categories of retention and pretension, we have done better in producing machinic retention, which means externalizing memory into architecture, books, culture in general, than, than in machinic pretension, in being able to somehow bring the future into present. So we're always better in bringing the past into present through these forms of externalization than to bring the future to present. Our computers heavily favor retention and can only project the future based on what is already retained as data. Our current computational paradigm has a shelf life shorter than a quarter of a century. Modeled on 19th century empiricism, our data-based machines are too positivist and statistical in practice to perform desires that are not rooted in the past. They know how to process and understand recorded information, bringing multiple sources of flat data together in order to create multidimensional virtual objects, but they don't know how to deal with the future. They even know how to activate these instances of the past to statistically project a probable future. But as we know, data is a form of dead matter and thus our machines do not know how to encounter the living world prior to its datafication. 
As with the human process of retention, for our world to be understood by our machines, it must first become legible as data. The differences to note here are between text, meaning, interpretation, and wisdom. In most life forms, certainly in humans, the urge to understand or have traction on the world arrives prior to the formation of memory. We have now created the first set of machines that read. We are in the process of creating machines that understand and interpret. But the trajectory in which we create the machines that desire and demonstrate wisdom will be stalled. Our ability to arrive at new qualitative transformation of understanding based on the accumulation of quantitative data is the beginning of the winter of artificial intelligence. Once every object in the world is completely mapped out, once every person and entity in the world, dead or alive, is connected to 24-hour, seven days a week networks, once we figure out ways to monetize these transactions and lay down the control grid to run this machine smoothly, regardless of its natural and geopolitical costs, we will reach the final limits of the current computational paradigm. Even though, even today, after two decades of having access to the internet, most people in, so, in the so-called advanced societies still experience data disconnection and variable speeds of internet. Once we overcome all these, once everyone's connected all the time at high speed with no interruption, and th that's when the cold winter actually begins. We are still 10 or 20 years away from this moment because we have yet to make the process of data retention and protention via the internet fully uninterrupted and automated. But once these conditions are met, intelligent technologies will begin to stagnate and fade into the background. So it's kind of like some people think once we get there, that's when the acceleration will take place. Whereas the other opinion is no, once we get there, we're going to realize that actually we lack conceptual tools to actually go further. And it's interesting because it coincides, the winter of AI coincides with like climate change. So it's like a, it's like a yin and yang to each other. The key to awakening from this slumber will lie in the practical ramifications of the fact that time is not unidirectional and the past is not all there is to the future. If phenomenology's main objective was to subject our time time insensitive epistemologies to the natural flow of time in and out of consciousness, then the emergence of more complex machinic intelligence beyond our current statistical machines requires us to liberate our subjective knowledge, knowledges from the limits placed on them by human and planetary temporalities. Meanwhile, the winter of AI will have a major cultural cost as the cultural field loses interest in technology as a subject but if we don't break through this limit, the political costs will become even higher than the cultural costs. The halting of computation's evolution will have a devastating effect on social struggles and emancipation. A tool that once helped to distribute privilege and broaden the power structure becomes the enemy of its former self and will only service those who already have power. Did we look at this slide long enough? <laughs> One way to understand politics is to view it as the conditioner of the social atmosphere in which the autonomous evolution of technology unfolds. You know, like, like the glass structure of, a, of an aquarium, right? That holds the water that, that in which then the life forms can, like certain life forms can dwell. This is why we need to think harder about capitalism and its precise socio-anthropological operations if we are to situate the human-machine collaborations we have thus far and describe them instead as machine intelligence and understand where they're going. What is the spirit of capitalism today? Or better said, what is the social power, nature, and technological reality of capitalism in terms of uh, our contemporary moment of technological evolution? So, how do we understand capitalism in this, in this other side of the, the triple helix, right? Or how to look at the capitalism from the point of view of technology in this three-sided evolution that we already, hopefully, you remember I was talking about. 
Capitalism is not the melting pot of different spheres of natural, social, and technological life. It is not a vortex that constantly swallows the world. The world has not become one big ball of a system which is pulver with its pulverized parts rendered unrecognizable. Rather, capitalism is rather it is the case in which the epistemic logic of capitalism, like how I quoted Stiegler, has been slowly transplanted into the local conditions of each field and activity, reprogramming them according to capitalism's own logic so that they each function more or less based on capitalist economy and its principles, but, it, but still in their own specific way. So say, the way capitalism functions in the art world is not like exactly the way it functions in market or in like stock market, but they're still on a meta level is very similar because capitalism inscribes its logic in the way that field operates in its own specific way. Meanwhile, as we navigate up the hierarchy within different fields of social life, they converge into that one thing which is the real capitalist mode of power in its highest and most intense but also universal scale. This is where Obama meets Beyonce on his inauguration day or where Jay-Z dances with Maria Abramovic at the Gogosian Gallery. This doesn't mean that all of these activities from the bottom of the social hierarchy and all the way up are becoming one. Quite contrary, the structure of capitalism, despite its pyramidal essence, maintains a fractal ontology. Capitalism is the braiding of several converging pyramids that join to create one giant one, that of the universal capitalism schema of power. I'm drawing a lot from two economists called uh, Jonathan Nitsen and Shimshon Bichler with a book called Capital as Power, a work of which who's been used to d develop newer ideas of political economy by our colleague and friend Sohail Malik in a very long essay published two years ago called Ontology of Finance. All of this is free PDF available. You can download and read. There's actually, I also helped a friend to reduce Sohail's essay to a shorter version called Ontology of Finance Redux, which is only 15 pages. So you can also download these if you want to like get deeper into like these newer ideas of what is the nature of capitalism. Like an eternal volcano erupting in reverse, the very top is sucking into itself and fuses together money, power, intellect, creativity, and celebrity power while at the same time holding on to elements of each specific pyramid as their figureheads. Meanwhile, from the perspective of the ground where most people exist, to be, su to be a successful player in any given field, one needs to battle like a warrior with one's peers to be granted upward navigation. And as a player moves higher, he or she gets closer and closer to players from other fields who also have beat the competition. These select few continue their ascent together. Capitalism corrupts the principle of adaptation in nature and transforms it into pure survivalism for the sake of second nature. Capitalism turns social cooperation into open war, transforming communication into control. In terms of class struggle, what we are facing now is capitalism heightening intensity. Moving from the 99% on the ground to the 1% on the top is becoming exponentially more difficult. The pyramid of power is narrowing. The middle class and upper middle class have historically been suspended between the top and the ground functioning as a filter in the upward movement of lucky actors. At the same time, the pyramid is not only narrowing, but also slowly disappearing. We are rapidly moving towards a structure with a large base and a very narrow top, without many layers of strata in between. The future shape of the social power structure is a former pyramid with its head cut off. As the mutated top flies further into the space, the rest of the social body collapses on the ground, intensifying competition at its base and inspiring ever new and inventive ways of reaching towards or hacking into the flying mantle. A new trend is emerging. Technological progress is gradually slowing down. 
Those who, for whatever reason and through whatever means, have managed to pull themselves higher up in the pyramids of social power are beginning to have a different relationship with technology than those at the bottom. For those who are in the higher strata, technology is merely a tool. If you have already secured yourself a higher position, intense and invasive technologies just seem like a hassle or a necessity that can help in maintaining your position, but you don't want to hang out with them too often. For the rest who have not secured a permanent place in the higher, cla higher class upper strata, who do not own property, who live paycheck by paycheck, technology is the, one of the only remaining spaces available for antagonism, navigation, and hacking into a higher, higher class. The social space of the digital becomes a track and field of, for those who have no other space in which to compete and proliferate. This new class struggle shrinks the space of economic and political competition as the digital footprint of an ever-increasing world population grows even larger and larger. If you consider all human activity as culture, the inner pyramidal culture wars in each field of social activity becomes a feature of new class system described earlier. So people from within fields attack each other fiercely. And of course, through like technological means, these things go viral. With the subsumption of adaptive cooperation by survivalism, war no longer functions as a metaphor for describing human activity and instead becomes an everyday practice. The militarization of the digital means that if the cyberspace was previously conceived as prosthetics of the real, today this relationship is overturned and the real is slowly becoming the extension of the virtual. In this hostile environment, those with traction in the physical world attempt to fight back using both their physical and virtual arsenal. In fact, all sides try their best to black box their own operations and to surveil those of the others. Hey, the new center is somewhere there, right? Eh? Yeah, we're number 10. Yeah, this was like one of these memes created to kind of like uh, just attack accelerationism, but, it, but it's actually a joke done by accelerationists to kind of like make fun of those who critique accelerationism. So, and then it kind of went, went viral and people like tagged me and I noticed it because somebody tagged us to it. And sit at the top of the pyramid is Reza Nagarastani. <laughs> A multipolar surveillance regime is then established in which not only the state, big corporations, and mass media, but also smaller players can watch and archive the world. In the battlefield, the fear of being watched will be utilized as a way to slow down the competition in the digital sphere. The goal is to drive the lower classes to frustration with technology. The pushback against what has been recently characterized as fake news is partially the rejection of mass participation in social media and is indicative of a new relationship between people and the infrastructure of planetary scale computation. The culture of the educated middle class has always been highly anti-technological to begin with. Story after story in the mainstream media reiterates how technology is detrimental to the development of children, how it interrupts our normal cognitive ca capabilities, and how it isolates us and causes autism on both individual and social levels. Meanwhile, the emerging class of high-tech multi-billionaires have taken an opposite stance so far, encouraging 24-7 connectivity while directing their financial focus towards expanding further into platform capitalism. Despite an immediate clash, these two distinct developments are not oppositional in the long term. Because as data collection is outsourced to smart objects with little or no active human participation, technology will slowly slip into the background. We will still face the overarching mechanisms of control and measurement of our data. However, the ever-increasing process of automation camouflages surveillance to create the perception that life is normal and natural. We enter a state not unlike the life of the main character in The Truman Show. One can try to withdraw from technology and maintain sovereignty with private space, but in reality, the automated capture of data makes surveillance inescapable. In this future, the apparatus of surveillance from today will, camo will be camouflaged into the familiar world and basically taken for granted as part of the landscape. 
We might even begin to think that after an oversaturation with technology for a few decades, we are returning to a more natural life reminiscent of the pre-internet era. But of course, it's just there. It's just painted. The nature is painted for you. Right underneath it will be all the, all the data capture mechanisms. Trump's ascendance from his position behind the digital screen to actual political power in the White House not only proves that the virtual can now extend into the real, but also that the kind of corrosive entropy with which the technological bears on the real might be a sign that our future emancipation is synonymous with rejecting technology and further evolution, further evolution today. And as justified as it might be to suggest that Trump politics is a form of deadly artificial intelligence in the spirit of the Terminator Skynet, we can't possibly suggest against this machinic beast by foreclosing on the role of technology. Machinic intelligence has always been actualized through human use and collaboration. All wars must end and can end. And we ought to insist on a future not based on crude competition for survival, but rather on adaptive co cooperation that prioritizes the collective and the universal over the selfish and the singular. By intensifying and accelerating our participation in the evolution of technology, not only can we alter its political trajectory, but our participation at various levels as users, managers, designers, and engineers, and philosophers even, can ensure that emerging forms of machine intelligence will inherit ethics and aesthetics more in tune with the political system we prefer to have in the future. Thank you. How many minutes was it? You, you have three minutes left. <clears throat> Very That's good. So Siri will talk to us in three minutes. Yeah, it's going to like ring. So. We wait for her anticipation. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, for this uh, generous visual travel through many imaginaries of the machinic. And I was wondering, um, throughout this kind of naturalization of the machinic that we see on the first images and this uh, this merge of the two realities um, through this, you know, feedback temporal arches via Bergson that you evoke, for example. If we don't achieve like a complete uh, virtualization of what's around us, but if this narrative is a bit universalizing at the same time, because as the weather that you describe in the winter of AI with the images that evoke, the weather is an open system, and although cybernetics mostly talks about closed systems, uh, you know politics and uh, it's always related to a more frictional contact with the world. So I would try to stress a more positivistic view on the technological use, which is not guiding us towards a dead end or a more like sterile relation with machines, but maybe something that takes the emancipatory uh, potential of coding, uh, learning coding in schools that the UK is, for example, teaching since 2014 to kids since five year old and how these uh, different, different narratives um, can allow a more like entropic relation with the world that has more like gradients uh, and uh, that allows space for potential and also space for debate on ethical and legal algorithms that you were just mentioning that it's urgent and Susan Chupley has been working about it and several people. It was also in the discussion on this morning workshop with Jean. So I want to reverse engineer this narrative a little bit and try to bring forward. But, but I think we're saying the same thing. OK. Uh, OK, so, so to, to, to set it, to, to, to kind of like talk about what is, the, to simplify it into like, one view of acceleration is that we don't need to worry too much about, about the future, because winter will never be there, because, because our interactions with machines and the way we, things are setting up Automatically, we, we're going to get there before we know it. We go, we're going to break through this and get to singularity or get to actual mm -hmm. like thinking machines who will be there. We don't have to worry about it. So that's one view that is shared by tech optimists, mm -hmm. but also by 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 techno fascists who mm -hmm. dream of this sort of like merging of the sort of like very organic 
merge between capitalism and, and technology. Mm -hmm. but, but on the other side, you have people who think that, no, actually these limits are, these, these conceptual limits have a lot to do with like how we understand time and how we understand thinking. And basically, mm -hmm. we will reach these limits. And, and it, it, is the, it, is, it, is a, it is a political and scientific and philosophical task to break through this. Part of it being mm -hmm. done by people like Susan, you are naming. So this is now the, yeah, so, so basically, I tend, to, I tend to be somewhere agnostic, somewhere between. So that's why the paper was written mm -hmm. from sort of like covering okay. these both contradictory positions. Mm -hmm. because, because on one hand, you can just think that, that evolution doesn't really have an engineer, right? So if evolution doesn't have an engineer, so this evolution will itself be without an engineer. But from the other hand, I want to participate as a human in what kind of futures we want to have. And, and that definitely involves working on these problems as mm -hmm. it came up in the workshop today, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to virtualize a future, both dark futures and light futures, and somehow bring some of that back in terms of the art, culture, policy, mm -hmm. and kind of like try to like start working on the kind of future we want now, rather than saying like, oh, evolution will just take care of itself and things will just evolve somehow and we deal with it in the future. I would agree. I don't think we have natural selection these days. I think we have cultural selection, or if you want, technological Absolutely. selection as well. But I would open the debate straight because I'm sure there are comments from uh, the audience and continuing the debates on Jean's workshop. Who has questions? It's a question. Maybe a pretty straightforward would be why are you dedicating your talk to the Autolith group? Oh, mm, well, that's that's a that's a good. I mean, it's not a secret. There's there, there's there's two ways of looking at it. One one is that uh, a lot of this, a lot of the a lot of the the conclusion of this paper happened while I was staying with Angelica and Kojo at their place in London because of the travel ban that, that, that Trump put, and I couldn't go back to New York, so I stayed with them. And I kind of dedicated the, the, the paper to them because they were generous enough to let me hang out with them, but also to think together and think with Kojo because he's an amazing philosopher and go over some of these concepts and sort of like get his feedback. So really, it involved intense conversations with both Angelica and Kojo. And the second, second is that... Um, these conversations were somehow directly or indirectly reflected in a very beautiful work of art they produced for Sharjah Biennale. It's called The Third Part of the Third Measure. It's a new piece that they produced, and it kind of like, it's, I mean, I'm not going to spoil it because it's a, it's a great film, and hopefully it will travel to your city and you guys will see it, but it's a, it's a, it's a two-monitor piece, and it's a recording of a music by an American experimental composer named Julius Eastman. So they recorded this piece, but also like sandwiched it between this like political declaration that he made. And it's kind of like it's about like what is the role of art in our time? That kind of like reflects on some of the stuff that I was saying at the end of the end of the presentation. So that's why I, it's dedicated to them. It's also in print. It will be dedicated to them, and it just it's it's theirs. I mean, then. Lisa. What's the, the justification for the evolutionary language that you use throughout? Uh, because, because I guess I'm a Hegelian <laughs> at the end of the day. And, and it's, it's one way. I mean, of course, we can, like, we can ontologize things and say like, that history doesn't exist. Because to me, the word history and the word evolution are somehow entangled. So if you, it's the minute you're talking about history, you have to really think about evolution. Because there's no way, and I mean, evolution is positive and negative because you have devolution too, right? But to me, it's it's like it's it's impossible to to deal with time and history without thinking about things change in time, and what whatever you want to call it. Okay, if we want, don't want to call it evolution, we should come up with new terms. But basically, how do you account for transformation that happens to the object and the space in time? So that that is that is what I call evolution. Those changes, and you know, we we cannot disagree. I hope that things and the space in which the thing exists exist changes or transform in time. Right. I think so it's Lisa, a lack of a better word, maybe. Lisa had a question. Yeah, yeah, okay, um, a, a language question also. So I really enjoy, or I really 
think the distinction between artificial and mechanic is very helpful. I was wondering if you might also want to say a little bit on the virtual as your word choice for that set of practices and perhaps in contrast to say the digital or other aligned concepts. Yeah. The Thank you so much. Because the virtual kind of like brings it back to like processes that already exist in nature, right? So the minute you're talking about digital, you're tying it to this particular form of computation that emerges out of the Turing machine, which we saw with the first slide, right? But when you're talking about virtuality, virtuality is like, like almost like is a requirement for any kind of cognition to exist, even maybe in plants, right? Let alone animals and then humans, right? So, to, so for me, virtual. Virtual is basically the way you you experience presencing right now because this, this room and the world you see is a is a your mind is virtualizing this. This room doesn't look like this. The colors are not like this. The, the shapes are not like this, right? But your mind virtualizes and convinces you that this is real. So when you wake up, you don't freak out. You say like, well, where where am I? What is this, right? And it gives it to you every day in the same manner. So you get you get comfortable into walking out of your bed into the world, right? So, so to me, the, ex the real being in the world is virtual to begin with, right? And, and because of that, it's easier to then sort of like not create dichotomies and see the digital as sort of like a new form of like a limited and form of us sort of like, uh, like learning from the world and learning from nature and redoing it with our limited knowledge of mathematics and physics and stuff into, into digital machines. More comments? Yeah, just a quick question. Like, um, like listening to your presentation, I was kind of thinking about uh, Virilio and like this kind of catastrophic vision some, somehow. Um, do you relate to this kind of? Uh, thinker or like, uh, I don't well, know, what is you your know, take uh, on it? Uh, interesting that, that, that Virilio's name came up. My, 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 my um, colleague, Jason Adams, will be doing a, a course, because he's one of the authorities in, on Virilio, and he just finished writing a very long Virilio entry into, into, uh, into Oxford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So he's doing a course on Virilio, and I think, the, but but I'm very like ignorant of Virilio because I always th thought of his discourse as too religious or religious religiously linked, right? But to me, this more goes back to sort of like uh, the the sort of like the nihilistic and catastrophic dimension of Nick Land's thought, which then he the way for him to cope with it is to present it to you as good news rather than a bad news. So he's he, Nick Land is the guy that comes from the future to tell us about like the possible catastrophes that are waiting for us to happen as nature and capitalism and technology become one, except he comes back and gives it to us with joy and celebrates this catastrophe, this impending catastrophes, and tells you that don't try to manage it, don't try to engineer it, there's nothing you can do, just give yourself to it and, and enjoy the end of humanity as we know it, and celebrate the emergence of this like monster that is part body, part capital, part technology. Whereas, of course, I understand the diagnosis, but it makes me immediately want to do the opposite of that, which is to perform some kind of like uh, inter intervention. Do we have more thoughts from the room? Uh, one in the back. Hi. Hey. Um, <clears throat> maybe if you could just say more about this, um, what you were saying about capitalism not um, pulverizing everything into non-specific mass and maybe um, say more about it in relation to, let's say, the potential for most things to be financialized. The, the good potential, right? Or the bad potential? <laughs> have a go, whichever. Now, uh, how much time do we have? I don't know. But we have, um, like minutes. Okay, so... So this this is also another another contention that like it would be great to like if uh, to 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 talk about it because it's not in in a paper and this is something that 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 I have come to understand and not believe but like I strongly feel this right that that um, capitalism is I mean capitalism is very very similar to to nature. Cap Nature is like we 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 we've learned through naturalism. We've learned to love nature, right? And think of nature as this like 
beautiful, ideal place, right? It's beautiful to look at, green, lovely, but nature is actually very like inhuman and, and, and unjust. It's very like dangerous place. A big elephant can just like crush a little bird and walk and there will be no justice for that, right? That's the kind of world that nature is. And through sort of like, through, uh, through culture basically, we've, we've built systems like architecture, cities, political system to kind of like preserve us from this harshness of the reality of nature. The whole, the whole enlightenment, at least ideally, beside its colonial, colonial aspect and beside what it did to a lot of other, other problem it caused, was to somehow overcome the, 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 the unjust uh, essence of nature through sort of like human engineering and human, human intervention. With, capital, with the emergence of capitalism, what we get is actually the return of nature in the form of this, the form of this like crazy uh, artificial form. That kind of nature's come back with a vengeance. And in fact, that's why techno-fascists and people on the right celebrate capitalism, like Nick Land. For them, capitalism is just the return of nature. We should love it, it's just nature, you know, like it's natural selection, powerful winds, it's great, it's lovely, it's beautiful, we should aestheticize it, we should celebrate it, right? And, and for me, the, 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 the anti-capitalist, anti-capitalism has to understand that in a way it's anti-nature. So we, we have to kind of like do away with our sort of like naive love of nature and understand that like going Getting over capitalism also might involve getting over our sort of like love of nature, right? And understand, you know what I mean? Love of nature in a way that like say a transsexual wants to get over nature. Say, okay, nature wants me to be a man, but I actually want to be a woman and I'm going to get over that, right? Because nature is not always just. Nature is unjust, right? So, so these things all go kind of like hand in hand, right? And, it, and you know what I mean? People who... So, so a lot of people who reject technology and love nature, they don't understand that how close they are to these techno-fascists because they're the two sides of the same coin. One side wants to reject technology and takes us back to, back to nature. The, the, tech, the, 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 the Elon Musk and the Nick Land tells you that, oh, but the new nature is this. Let's just move together to the other side because we're going to give you even a better nature, right? So, and, and, and us, the sort of like the old humanists, People who want equality, emancipation, democracy, whatever, if you put it in a 20th century language or if you want to bring it into new language or whatever we want post-capitalism today, we are some, somehow stuck between these two visions of like Puritan nature, the old nature, and this new techno nature that the capitalism is wanting to like uh, force us into. So that's, I hope that's part of, the, part, part of what you were part of what you were talking about. But like the part to understand is also that uh, cap like nature, capitalism diversifies. You know what I mean? Like how, if you just take the, take the metaphor, right? Like if you look at the natural history, through our natural history, species kind of like proliferated. Out of this proliferation came more species, right? So it's, it's kind of like similar to capitalism. That's why capitalism, unlike what a lot of like leftist thing, doesn't make everything look the same. It actually changes things and it proliferates new forms of, new forms, it, it kind of like encourages diversity in a way, right? And um, like Sohail Malek, I, I really don't think that debt and financialization is a are always a negative thing. There are ways to use debt, and there's ways to use even like crude financialization and put it towards good use. But the problem is that financialization is always done by, uh, you know what I mean, like basically monetizing, basically. Monetizing is always done by the people who already have power and they want more for their own benefit. And it will always end up costing us as the risks is pushed down to us, where benefits are pushed up, right? But, but the type of risk society that is part and parcel of financialization is something that is basically part of this, what we were talking about at launch a new paradigm. And, and we should not be afraid of this risk, risk society that we're moving into, but we should find out ways in which the sort of like the technologies of the risk society in which hedging and financialization are part of are done 
not by the powerful people and not always for their benefit and how we can use these technologies which are in a way about bringing the future future to present and we can just connect it to all these philosophical things we discussed about time right because that's what that's what financialization and, and risk involves risk involves temporality right risk involves think, thinking about the future bringing the future putting a price to it and then saying who's going to pay for that right so yeah so i think there's ways to use these technologies in a post capitalist future so i don't think all all financialization is bad, but the problem is always that the bad guys end up doing it for their own benefit, and, and only we, we inherit the risk while they take all the profit. I think maybe we should continue on the general debate yes. after the respondents. Thank you, Mo, and Julio will introduce our next speaker. Can I leave this one? Thank you.